So, Chris, thank you for being on the show with me again. Remind everybody who you are and what you do. I'm Chris Hadnagy. I'm the CEO of Social Engineer LLC, uh, which is a company focused on the human side of security. And I also run the uh, ILF or the Innocent Lives Foundation, which is a nonprofit that helps law enforcement uh, geolocate people who are trafficking children and creating child abuse material. And right. thank you for having me back on. I really sure, man. It. No, yeah, I always want to have you back on. You know, we when we talked this last time, you know, uh, it was really just so focused on parenting. Like after I was done talking to you, I was like, man, I gotta have Chris back <laughs> on because I just feel better after talking to him. Thank you. So uh, that was really cool. I'm glad that you mentioned the Innocent Lives Foundation because we kind of want to focus on your work uh, with that group. We didn't really talk about that this last time, yeah, but. Um, what led you to start such a foundation? Well, um, so in my corporate work, you know, we do something that I call adversarial simulation. So the industry mm -hmm. calls it pen testing, but um, we, we call it adversarial simulation. And then one test I had for a really large organization, uh, we were doing an internal test and we saw that this one computer had all this traffic going to Tor. So Tor is the dark web, uh, right. the, 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 the uh, VPNs you use to get on the, the onion network or the dark web. And I went to the person who was my point of contact and I said, hey, would there be any reason why someone in this department would be in, in the dark web? And they said, no, no, that would, we would not even want that. You know, can you tell us what they're doing? And I'm like, we can't because uh, it's, you know, it's a pretty tight VPN, but we can put a key logger on his machine if you own the machine. And he's like, we do. So we put a key logger on and we found that this guy was um, using corporate funds to um, to go to Philippines. He was molesting kids. He was um, recording what he was doing and then trading it on his work oh, computer. Gosh. And it was uh, like, I knew the stuff existed. Yeah. But the first time you come in contact with something like that, it's almost um, like someone punched you so hard in the chest that you yeah. can't breathe. You know, yeah. like it just, it takes all the wind out of you. And I went direct into like, I want him dead mode. <laughs> and uh, don't blame me there you know, and, and, and I and knowing you know who I am and what I can I was like I don't I, I want to I want to stop this so I called right. the FBI we set up a sting operation and he's in prison good and that felt amazing and I mm -hmm. said to, that was the first time I said to myself wow I'm doing uh I'm doing something with my career that I you know I'm just a hacker I didn't know I could do anything that would actually save somebody and I it was like a moment an epiphany where I started to tell students when I would teach about this story and I would say, look, if you're ever in this situation, like you could do something good with this career. Like this is not just about mm -hmm. making money and hacking computers. Like you could do something that may save a life. And I didn't think about that ever, but I was telling this story and class after class, I would tell this story and just encourage people. And then I had a few folks come up and tell me that, that they had similar situations, but they didn't know what to do. Right. And they were wondering if I would write up like a, like directions on what, what to do <laughs> next time this happens. Yeah. So as I'm doing that, I'm thinking, you know, I wonder if I had a, like a, like a group that would mm -hmm. focus our talent. So I went to my lawyer and I said, look, I got a crazy idea. And, and, the, and it was crazy because everywhere I looked, like when I went out to see if I can volunteer somewhere like Thorn or other places, yeah. they were all focused on creating tools or saving the kids. And I was thinking, well, what I want to do is, I mean, yes, I want to save kids, but I want to stop the perpetrators. I want to stop yeah. the people who are hurting them. And I couldn't find anyone that was doing that. Uh, there was like a few splinter organizations that were really small. So I'm like, this is going to be new. So I went to my lawyer and said, like, can I do this? Is this legal? And he went, let's figure it out. So we did. And we figured out the things we had to overcome. And um, I launched it just about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, three or four people will help me out after a conference and we'll hack away at some servers and give it to the feds, you know, and I have six full time employees and 50 volunteers and we just completed over 600th case. Wow. It's very it's, cool. I know it, like it, I sit back and it blows me away, but it all started because of that, that very first case thinking now that, hey, I can actually do something good with all this stuff. Yeah, man. And that's fantastic. I'm glad that you went to your lawyer first instead of yeah. just being cavalier about it and saying, hey, we're going to go off and be vigilantes here. You went at it at a, at a systematic approach to make sure that what you did stuck, because I know that um, I, I, I know from law enforcement friends that I have in all levels of law enforcement, 
you know, when it comes to dealing with what we're calling CSAM now, um, mm -hmm. you have to document all of that. And that's unfortunate because sometimes there's a lot of it, but I'm glad that you're taking the right path and making sure that you're getting the good information to the people who are, who are going to need it. You so know, I appreciate you saying that because when I started it, one of the things, you know, I mean, I, I did the you know internet research, which I, you know, watched to catch a predator <laughs> yeah. and those things and thought, well, maybe that's yeah. what we do, right? That's what we do. Right. And then I started reading and I found an article that said that 80% of uh, the cases that that show to catch a predator brought to court got kicked out of court. Right. Because of mishandling of evidence or they mm -hmm. did something too much or they're the ones who started the sexual conversation. And I went, Man, I'm right. not a cop. So right. I could see myself messing this up. So when I went back to the lawyer, I went, look, the main goal, because I, I said, if we do this, it's a nonprofit, which means I make no money from it. So mm -hmm. if I'm going to volunteer my very limited time in my life, it's not to feel cool. I mm -hmm. want it to lead to saving a, a child or stopping a predator. So what is needed to make an arrest? So I actually went to NICMIC, which is the, the National Center mm -hmm. for Missing and Exploited Children. And I said, if a case comes into you, what is needed for it to lead to a warrant that can be arrestable? And they gave me a list of things. And then I went to buddies I had in the FBI and I said, hey, if someone were to hand you a case, like a, a, a paper file that said, here's a child predator, what would need to be on that for you to go kick a door in and arrest this guy? And they told me. Mm -hmm. So when I went back to form the ILF, I said, then this has to be our rules that we have to be able right. to provide this. And one of the main things was it has to be legal. Mm -hmm. And it has to be completely above board and they have to be able to reproduce it. So if I do one thing that is sketchy, right, right, I hacked a server just a little bit to go get that mm -hmm. name. Mm -hmm. And now they can't do that legally. That case gets thrown out. Yeah. So we have to, so the rule set became everything we do has to be above board. So that way it can lead to an arrest. Right. And, and it became, you know, part of our original laws, bylaws in the organization mm -hmm. And, um, and along with that and therapy, it became really the ground foundation for everything yes. that, that we did in ILF. Yeah, I've, um, I've talked to people in various degrees of this, and um, they all talk about how the people who are actually the good guys behind the keyboards are affected by what they see, and they go to therapy, and they do all that sort of stuff. So it sounds like, man, you've got a good foundation from the crowd up. Sorry for that pun there. No, it's but, okay. Uh, we, we, uh, the first person I hired as an employee was a therapist mm -hmm. and um and she her job she's a director of wellness and her job is that everybody that works for us has to see her once a month yeah so you get good. mandated therapy every month because even though we're not looking at the images you know we're using technology to blur images you're reading good. Mm -hmm. stories you're reading what people say and the way they talk right. about children it's so disgusting Mm -hmm. And it, it affects you. It can't, if it doesn't affect you, then you need to be out of this organization. Yeah. It has to, a normal right. person cannot consume that content and not be affected. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, your group is working all the time and you're looking at trends and you guys have kind of stumbled across uh, a troubling trend. Can you share with us what you guys are finding? Yeah. So this, when COVID kicked out, you know, it, it, let's think about, um, you know, child abuse material. You said CSAN, mm -hmm. right? Child sex right. abuse material. So uh, I, I hate to speak of it this way, but just to understand it, we have to speak of supply and demand. Oh yeah. So yeah. Right, you got demand, which right. is going up because of the dark web and the ease of being anonymous on the internet. Mm -hmm. And then supply isn't there. So now COVID happens and the predators and the children are online more. Mm -hmm. So uh, predators started to troll around sites that kids would hang out, sites where kids would watch movies together. We actually found predators on homework sites. <sighs> um, we found predators anywhere a child is, mm -hmm. they're there. Right. right? And we just, so it's not just a, Discord. It's not just Discord. It's okay. everywhere. We found them. There was a site set up by, by real teachers that was legitimate. Mm -hmm. When COVID kicked out, a lot of kids started failing. And these teachers got together out of the kindness of their heart. And they said, let's put a homework site up where kids from anywhere around the globe can come and ask for help with their math, their science, whatever. Right. And it was free. And kids can come in and say, hey, I got an algebra one question. And some teacher would go, hey, I'm an algebra one teacher. What is it? I'll help you. Right. Well, quickly, predators went, this are kids asking to be in chats. And they mm -hmm. went in and they would offer and they would actually give them their math, math help. Right. But then they would start to move it to kick or move it to discord or move it yeah. to Instagram DMS. And next thing you know, there's, this is where the trend comes in. 
is it's, um, it's self-taken child pornography. And what that means is they convince the child to take the picture of themselves. So uh-huh. something like, you know, you make believe you're another 14 year old kid and you're going through the same problems that I'm going through uh, with my parents and I can't stand them and they're getting a divorce and they suck and this and that. And I'm going through the same exact problems. And then in a chat, the young lady, let's say, says, you know, well, it's, you know, I, I, I wish I had a boyfriend or I wish this or I can't get yeah. a boyfriend. I'm too yeah. ugly. And well, mm. I bet you're not ugly. Take a picture of your face. And then, oh, my God, you're so beautiful. And next thing you know, it's like, well, I bet you look great in a swimsuit. And then you know, one thing leads to another. I've seen these. I've actually seen the conversations in right. under 30 minutes. A child is taking a fully nude picture and sending it to this person. Now, once they have that picture, they then do something that is called sexploitation. Uh-huh. So now they say, hey, I'm not a 14 year old. I'm a 38 year old male. And I'm going to show this picture to your dad, unless you get on camera and you do stuff to yourself. Uh-huh. And now they video record that. And then that picture and those recordings now go into tradable packs on the internet for uh-huh. self-made child pornography. Right. And um, this has increased hundreds of percent since pandemic. Because again, the, de- the, the demand is there and the supply is also stuck at home. Yeah. And I don't know about your house, but my house wasn't designed to have four offices in it. So <laughs> right. when COVID kicked in, I had myself, my wife and my two kids all looking for places to work, do homework, spend time. So we weren't on top of each other and it ended up being bedrooms. So now mm-hmm. you have your teenagers in their room with their computers in yep. their bedrooms alone, yeah. mm-hmm. 18 hours a day on the unfettered internet. And yep. these things just happen to just go through the roof. And it was, it, it was, a, it was just appalling to see. And, and, uh, you know, the issue was like, what cop is going to go kick a door in and arrest a child for taking a picture of themselves? Yeah, right. I mean, you yeah. know, they're out there that they would, but a sure. normal police officer is, is going to have empathy and say, I don't yeah. want to arrest this child for this. Right. They yeah. Got and room. They're a victim. Right. And, and and that's the thing that the average police officer is like, wow, this is new. You know, yeah. they see new stuff on the job every day. But it's also like, what, you know, really, what what do I do here? And I'm yeah. hearing this, you know, as a parent, I know a little bit about this from the conversations that I've had previously on the show with uh, people in this fight like you are. And so I as a parent, I have to think, how could a kid think that any of this was a good idea? Yeah. So, you know, help us help us as and your dad as well, yeah. you know, help us as parents understand what the kids are thinking and how we can how we can turn that around. Yeah. So there's a few things at play here that we have to understand because, and I'm glad you asked this question because I have seen parents that are amazing, but I've also seen parents that when this happens, they say something to their child, like, what are you, how can you be so dumb? Yeah. And, and let's right. think this is not about stupidity. Yeah. This is human nature, mm-hmm. right? Yes. I, yes. We, we all want to feel accepted, loved, wanted. We mm-hmm. all want that. And now you have this, let's say in essence, a child who's at this uh, hormonal age where maybe their body's changing and they do feel ugly. And mm-hmm. now someone's telling them they're beautiful. Someone's telling them they're attractive. Someone's telling them they're hot. Mm-hmm. That feels good. Sure. It feels good. Okay. It feels good at my age. If, yeah, someone were to, it sure did. if I were to have a conversation with someone, heck, when I got on the show, you told me, yeah, you look so great with all the weight you lost. That felt you great. Just, yes. That it felt did. Great. No, I knew you weren't hitting on me, but that felt <laughs> great, right? Because that's human nature. Right. It feels, it feels good when people say nice things about you. Right. So now you have this, teenager who's not uh, you know not all critical thinking a lot of hormones and someone's telling them that they're beautiful Mm -hmm. and now they say you know well let me see a picture of your face and they send a picture non-nude right just a picture of their face and then the person sends a picture now of course it's not their real picture it's one they found on the internet but now there's this thing in social engineering that we call quid pro quo so i tell you something and you tell me something and it Mm -hmm. makes us equal And Mm -hmm. that makes me trust you. Now a chemical gets released called oxytocin. And that says, hey, he trusted me. I trusted him. Now we're friends. So now the next request doesn't seem weird. Right. right? It doesn't because now it's like, well, we are friends. So you said, I bet you look great in a swimsuit. No, I don't. Oh, come on. I bet you do. You just, those boys don't know what they're talking about. They're just stupid. Mm -hmm. Now sending that next picture, then it doesn't take long to go from there to, you know, what about in a bra? What about the top off? What about, you know, picture of your feet, something like that mm-hmm. to get, they make it more and more risque to where eventually there's a picture that would humiliate that child if it yeah. were to get released. 
Mm-hmm. Once that picture is in the hands, then everything flips. Right. Okay. So we're looking at a child who's been heavily manipulated by using their own emotional content to make them do something that they shouldn't do. It's not stupidity, right? Because when we, I mean, we're talking about being a parent on this podcast, but the very mm-hmm. same thing happens every day, catfishing against yeah. grown men right. or romance scams against older women. I, this is not limited to teenagers or teenage girls, boys, girls, older, younger. We all can fall for this. Yeah. It just so happens that like right now we need to talk about this as parents because our sure. children are being targeted directly by massive amounts of predators. Right. And I'm glad you brought up the fact that, you know, uh, you gave a lot of examples uh, for, for young girls, but it's also happening to young guys. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and this sort of thing's happening. But there's a point that I see frequently, and I know you will get this, and I know you can explain it better to us. Predators existed before the internet. Yeah. This is nothing new in humanity, right? It's just digitally, it's a little bit easier now. Yeah. I mean, sadly, uh, child predation has existed for as long as we have written human history. Yeah. Right. It, it's, it's existed and we've seen it. And, and throughout history, there has been societies that has accepted it at certain levels, like the Roman society, which used to mm-hmm. have children that were kept as slaves for sex. Um, so there was even societies that normalized this kind of disgust. Uh, right now in, in the world, there are, there are cultures that allow for the marriage of children that are under 15 years old, 13 mm-hmm. years old, 11 years old, mm-hmm. right? Uh, before a child is even fully developed physically or emotionally by scientific standards, right. they're able to now be involved in a lifelong relationship bearing children or making children. That's crazy, right? Mm-hmm. So child predation is nothing new, but now like any attack, Fishing is not new, right? Mm -hmm. Fishing is not new, but the medium is what has made it um, more prevalent. So now that the internet is here, now that the dark web is so easy to get on, now that crypto is so easy to buy, uh, these things have blown up in their volume. When, when, When I was a kid, if you wanted to see pornography, you had to go to the local convenience shop and steal a Playboy. (laughs) Sure. Right, or you yeah. had to go through that little curtain in the room in the video store and grab a tape and, and rent it. You know, mm-hmm. um, there was no I can find it on my phone, it didn't exist, right? But now you couldn't find it in your house, you couldn't find it anywhere. If your dad yeah. happened to have a photography oh, book, yeah, right, okay. happened to have a photography right. book that may have had one nude photo. I remember that as a kid. My mm-hmm. dad was a photographer and he had one book that had a chapter on filming uh, nude characters, and that was like the best thing ever, right? <laughs> but that's what you think when you're a kid, right? Right now, um, not only is pornography available at your fingertips, but the grossest forms of pornography. Mm-hmm abuse and animal pornography and and bsdm and violence Mm -hmm. are available and you don't even have to look like it's just available you don't have to be on the dark web you Mm -hmm. can just be on the open web and you can find this grossness so Mm -hmm. our children are not unless we're monitoring them unless we're uh, controlling their devices at certain ages our children Mm -hmm. could stumble or even look for or find or be shown these horrible things without much effort, way different than it was in the past. Yeah. So kind of tell us what are some red flags that we need to know as mm. parents that we can share with our kids to say, you know, cause you, you talked about saying the, the predators were on the homework site and then they moved it to another one. So that's kind of a red flag that we can glean from what you yeah. said. What are some other, uh, some other things we need to look for? Yeah. I like this question. So I'm going to approach it first from, from, let's say, the standard parent who says, I don't even know how to monitor. So right. let's not go sure. technological. Let's go, yeah. let's go psychological first. Um, I just got interviewed talking about this horrible incident up in Buffalo where that young man killed um, all yeah. of those, those black people and where uh, he was wanting to kill many more uh, black people. And, um, and, it, and, and there was something in that story that, um, that applies to this question. A teacher had expressed concern that Mm -hmm. there was some psychological imbalance for that young man. And it seemed that everyone ignored that concern. Yep. So I say to parents, when you see that your child has changed drastically, something has happened. Maybe they're isolating themselves more. They seem depressed. They seem sad. 
I wouldn't go to the thing they're they're going to hurt people or they're into right. pornography or they're being right. groomed. Let's not jump there. But when a change occurs, something has happened. Right. So my thing is, why not talk to them? Mm-hmm. I, oh, that sounds so scary. I'm telling you right now, I have an 18 year old in the house and talking to her scares the daylights out of me. Mm-hmm. It does because I could say one wrong thing. And I do <laughs> almost like, every conversation. Walk it off thin ice. <laughs> yes. And I say one wrong thing and the conversation is in the toilet. You know, it's just not going to go anywhere. Um, so yeah, it's scary. It's, it's difficult. It's not going to be easy to, to do, but, but you got to have that conversation. And if you notice those flags, if you notice a change, that's the first thing is you sit down and you say, Hey, I've noticed lately you seem a little depressed or you seem a little sullen. Uh, listen, if you don't want to talk to me about it, cause it's private, that's fine. But I want you to know that if someone is bullying you or if someone is harassing you on the internet, or if someone has made you do something that you don't want to do, that I am your advocate. I'm here for you. I won't Mm -hmm. judge you. I won't be mad. I won't be angry. I want to help you through whatever you're going through. And I would approach it that way. So you're not saying you must tell me what's going on or you start reading their emails or whatever. Maybe the problem has nothing to do with this. Maybe it's just Mm -hmm. a personal issue and they're going through teenage stuff. But by letting them know, hey, I'm here. And because a lot of times what predators do is they'll paint a picture that if you tell your mom you did this or you tell your dad you mm-hmm. did this, they're going to hate you. They're going to think you're a slut. They're going to call. They're going to they're going to kick you out. Right. They convince them that they're a bad kid for what they did. So mm-hmm. they don't want to talk to their parents. Well, if a parent ahead of time is saying, listen, if that happened, if something happened, I, I'm here for you. I mm-hmm. want to help you. I love you. I, there's right. nothing that can make me stop loving you. Right. Sometimes that's all a kid needs to hear. And, and I can tell you personal experience um, from a case that we worked where parents started to um, worry about their child. We just had this happen and they talked to her. They didn't, they, she was not, re- she wasn't willing. So then one day she was out and they checked the computer logs and they saw that she was in a chat and these guys were getting sexual with her mm-hmm. and they went to the police and the police said, we can't help you too bad. And they contacted ILF and we said, we can help. We'll, mm-hmm. help. we'll find these people. So we did. We found them. And they were not 16-year-olds as they were claiming. They were 32, 38, 40-year-old men mm-hmm. that were grooming this little girl. And we ended up getting um, federal police involved. Um, the, a, a restraining order was issued against them. And then the parents were able to present the evidence to the young girl. Mm -hmm. and save her and this was at a time when she was talking about physically meeting them right so because the parents took action they spoke to her they showed her on she would get so mad at them she would be she would say horrible things to them but they just kept loving her they just kept hugging her telling her it's going to be okay taking her away for a weekend just not punishing her just being patient with her and now they had this amazing relationship and she was saved from getting picked up And I look at that and I say, okay, great. Yep. People want to say ILF did great. It wasn't us. Mm -hmm. Those parents, right? We played a tiny part in that. The parents are the ones who said, you know what? The police said, no, but I'm not giving up. The parents are the ones who said, I'm going to keep showing you love. Even when you say horrible things to me, the parents are the ones who just kept loving her, regardless of how much she pushed them away. Parents like that, they saved that girl. That girl is now not being groomed. She's saved from sexual harm. She's saved from being picked up because of those parents. And that, that was a year long process. Yeah. I don't want to paint this picture that, you know, they did it in a month later, everything right. was saved yeah, and they were skipping through fields and daisies. And no, yeah. no, this was a year long process. And, and, but she's safe. So I tell that story because pe- people need to know it, it can work, but it may not feel like it. Mm-hmm. There were, there were days where those parents would call us and they would say, I think, I think we lost. I think it's, I think it's over. And we just be like, nope, don't, don't give up. Don't give up. You know, we just kept encouraging them and whatever, but it, it, you, you can't, you have to persist with this and parents that do, they're the ones who save their kids. Very good. That was a really long answer, but there's many other no, things. No, it's that a can very, done, very you know? good answer. Um, and that's good because it is parents, you know, every parent is a protector. That's the yeah. slogan of this show. And, yeah. and what I do is a secure dad. Yeah. So you've done a great job painting for us the picture of what we should do emotionally to connect with their kids, to help them. But I know some parents, when they hear these conversations say, well, I'm just going to go take all these devices and I'm going to go chunk them in the river. <laughs> Does that work? 
Well, no, because um, and I'll tell you a personal experience. Now, mine is I, through my child's life, through my daughter's life, I have set up at an age appropriate, I have set up monitoring, mm-hmm. blocking, um, rule sets on her devices. And routinely, like a tiny little cute terrorist, she has found ways to bypass everything <laughs> that I have done. Right. <laughs> and it was a constant battle. Mm-hmm. Now, I guarantee you, if I went and chucked her devices in the river, mm-hmm. she would have found a way to get her friends to buy her one and she would have had her own. Right. Yeah. So yeah. my my way I did it was and, you know, she'll tell you up front, she, she still hates it. But this is what I did when she was younger. I said, OK, Maya, here's the deal. You're, we're going to give you a phone, but I'm going to install this app on it. And I showed her the app mm-hmm. and I showed her, I said, you can look at it and you can watch me install it. And this is what it's going to monitor. And this is what I can see. And this is what I can do. So I'm showing you this because of one thing, if you don't want me to see it, then don't do it because Mm -hmm. these are the things that I can monitor. I didn't do it stealthily. And she goes, this is unfair. This is illegal. I'm like, it's not illegal. And (laughs) and, and it's not not unfair. (laughs) And it may feel unfair. And I said, I'm not doing this because I distrust you. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this because I distrust everyone else out there. And my job is, and I would give her analogies like, Maya, when it's your time to drive, do you think I'm just going to give you the keys and say, go figure it out? She's like, of course not. I'm like, and I'm not going to do that with your phone. Yeah. So did she love it? No. But did she accept it? Yes. And now as she proved to be trustworthy and as she got older, we opened those reins more. Mm-hmm. We gave her more freedom. We monitored less. And now she's 18 years old. We don't monitor her devices. We taught her to critically think. Yep. Um, we, we, we let her know that if anything ever happens, we are here for you. You can come to us. We'll, we'll be there for you. And we, we, uh, we share things like all of our locations. So Mm -hmm. I share mine with her. She shares hers with me. So that safety feature is there, right? So we do things where it's like, okay, listen, we want to be able to be safe with that uh, check-ins. So, hey, I'm out and it's late at night. I'm going to check in with you. I want you to check in with me, Mm -hmm. right? So I do the things I want her to do. And that makes the rule set safe. So I'm always like, look, if if you tell your child no technology in this day and age, you're going to make them an outcast. And other kids are going to be like, you're weird. And that's just going mm-hmm. to make them feel yeah. more distant. And mm-hmm. then they're going to resent you. So it's, it, to me, it's more about teaching your child how to use the things that are, that are available to them in an intelligent way mm-hmm. and in a safe way, just like you will with a car, just like you will with food, just like you would with alcohol. I don't know. Every parent's different, but when your children approach drinking age, you don't just say, Hey, here's a bottle of Everclear, go to town. <laughs> oh, you teach them how to, <laughs> you teach them how to drink responsibly right -hmm. right? if you teach them how to do everything through their life when they first start chewing solid food you don't give them a a a sirloin right you cut little pieces of food out and you show them how to chew it's it's everything we do with our child through their life we have monitored it to make it so it's safe for them this Mm -hmm. is no different this is no different even if you're not a technological parent it's still our job to 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 give them those little chunks as they get older and older right so We may not be technically or, you know, technologically sound as everybody else out there, but we're still parents and there's analog solutions to this digital problem. And it starts with us as parents. That's awesome. So let's say, oh, go ahead. I was going to say one one last thing on that. You know, one of the things I stink at social media, I stink at it. And I heard (laughs) through the grapevine that there was a way to do erasing messages, deleting messages on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And it made me really scared. So instead of saying to my daughter, hey, are you doing deleting messages? Mm-hmm. I went, you know what, I, I feel like I'm so stupid and old. I, I heard that you can send a message that deletes. And I think <laughs> yeah. that's kind of cool. Can you show me mm-hmm. how to do that on my phone? And mm-hmm. I handed her my phone. And she's like, dad, you're so old. And she grabbed <laughs> my phone. And in two seconds, she's showing me how to send a message that deletes. Mm-hmm. Now I know. I let her educate me. Right. Now, I didn't say to her, are you doing that? I didn't attack mm-hmm. her. I just went, okay, she knows how to do it. That's That means that there's a possibility she is. Right. So I need to be aware of of that. But now I know how to do it. I know I know how to check it. And now mm-hmm. I know where it is in Instagram. So I let her be my teacher to show me things that I didn't understand. And I didn't do it manipulatively. I wasn't like, you know, trying to be sly. I really didn't know. And I said, mm-hmm. can you show me? And then right. she did. Right. Very so good. it's things like that, that we can do when we don't feel technological that can make our kids, our teachers, and then we know what they know. Very good. So as we wrap up here, Chris, for, for the parents that are listening to the show who have that 
gut punch feeling that something's going on with their kids, what does, what does their next steps need to be? What's something tangible that they can go and do? Yeah. So uh, first things uh, you can do is have that conversation, right? That's step one, start a conversation. Second thing is, um, and, and it doesn't matter how old they are. uh, You own the home network. So you can yeah. in, on your home router, right? You can install most routers nowadays come with a filtering software where you can just see what websites are being visited. Mm-hmm. So you can turn that feature on in your router. So that way you could see, is your child going to sites that are filled with racism, bigotry, pornography, right. um, hate speak, things like that, that you should be concerned about, right? You can monitor that and check that. Now, if that happens, I wouldn't go kick their door in at one in the morning mm-hmm. and go, what the heck is this? <laughs> now, you know where they're going. And now you mm-hmm. say, Hey, I was just checking some things on our logs and I saw that this one site keeps coming up. I'm really concerned about this because I went to it and it's filled with X, whatever it is, right? right you whatever take, it is. And, and that stuff, that can't be in our house because we don't, we don't believe that way. Yeah. Like we don't, we don't yeah. go that way. Can you right. tell me why you would be going there? And maybe they're going to get mad, maybe whatever, but just that patient conversation. And if they are not willing to open up, you block that site. Now Mm -hmm. that's not going to fix the problem because they can just get off their internet and go on the phone Mm -hmm. and still go to it. But at least now they know, right. They know that, you know, so you start with the conversation. Second, you start with some monitoring. Then third, you go back to conversation and depending on their age, um, if they're under 18, you have the right to then monitor devices, to take devices away, to limit usage. Uh, One of the things we did with my daughter was we said, listen, uh, bedtime is uh, 1130. After that, you don't need a device. So Uh you can have it because you listen to music, but we have parental controls and that device is going off, which Uh means the only thing that will work for you is your alarm and your music. Everything else is going to be disabled because you don't need to be talking to people. What if one of my friends needs me? They can call you in the morning. Yeah. Right. They don't need to call you at one in the morning. Mm -hmm. They don't need to talk to you at two or three. That's ruining your sleep. And when you don't sleep, you get depressed. And when you're depressed, it affects your mood, which affects us. So no, we're going to help you be healthy. Mm -hmm. That's my job. Right. And she didn't like it, but that was the rule set. Yeah. So that's what we, that's my suggestions for what parents can do. Very good, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for, for talking with us again on such a, and and talking to us so easily and approachably about a really hard topic. Um, you've you. made this easy to understand and easy to accept and actually hopeful for what we're going to do next as parents. Where can people find out more about you and your mission? Uh, before I tell you this, I want to say you make it easy because your questions are excellent. So you're a really <laughs> good you. interviewer. So you, thank, thank you. you for that. Um, actually, if you go to innocentlivesfoundation.org, uh, we have documents on there for parents on how to have a conversation. That mm-hmm. actually comes from the ex-director of the FBI's BAU. Um, He wrote an article called Trust, and it actually talks about how to have a conversation with your child about these very hard topics. Very good. Then we have a guide on how to set up monitoring on an iOS device. Uh, We have a guide how to set up monitoring on Android devices. Uh, And there's many other blogs and posts on there that parents can use to um, that completely for free that they can you can use to, to figure out how to not only talk with your kids, but monitor them and, and protect them. So innocentlivesfoundation.org um, is some great resources on there for that. Very good, Chris. Thank you for talking with us today. And thank you for everything that you're doing, buddy. Thank you. I appreciate it.